Well, can you think of a time when you have experienced conviction? You were convicted about something, either to stop doing something that you were doing or to do something that you weren't doing. Okay, I'll tell you about a couple times for me. So number one, when I was five years old, oh, terrible, terrible day. I was in daycare after school, and I was jealous of another kid who had an action figure that I really, really wanted. And so this is the only time I've done this in my life, but I made a plan and I stole his action figure. I swiped it off of a desk when I knew he would be away off of a table. I stuck it in my backpack. He cried. He and his parents searched the entire daycare for it. I said nothing. I took it home with me. I didn't show my parents. I hid it in my room. And here's the thing. As soon as I took that home, I wanted this thing so bad, this action figure. And as soon as I took it home, it was like, it was like fire in my hands. I couldn't, I, I'd never played with it even once. I couldn't touch it. I was so strongly convicted that this thing became hateful to me. And in fact, what I ended up doing when I was five, instead of returning it, it to him because that was too hard for me, I ended up burying it in my backyard. I hated this thing so much. I was so convicted, five years old. All right, uh, moving forward now, thinking about, now I'm about 20 years old. Uh, not now, but in this story that I'm about to tell you. So I'm about 20 years old, and I've been a Christian for less than a year. And I started to become convicted that I needed to tell other people what I had learned about Jesus. And I was terrified to do it. Only I couldn't get away from it. I would try to ignore that conviction, and it kept on coming back. And I'm thinking of one particular moment. It, it would come to me sometimes, even with total strangers, that conviction would come to me. And so there was this moment, um, I was driving home, and I, I parked um, in front, on the street in front of my house, and I saw this couple walking down the street, and I felt so convicted that I needed to go talk to them about Jesus. And I was terrified to do it. But I had ignored this conviction a number of times already, and I knew what happened when I ignored it. If I ignored this conviction, it would only grow in me, and I would have an awful rest of my day. And so even though I didn't want to talk to these strangers, which is actually something I'm quite scared to do naturally, I knew the rest of my day would be awful because I felt this conviction. So I jumped out of my car. I said, guys, I know this is really weird, but I feel like I need to talk to you guys about Jesus. And they said, that's really weird because we're on our way to a Bible study right now for the first time in our lives. And we, we, we're trying to figure out if this God thing is real. Conviction. When is a time when you have experienced conviction? You need to start to think about that, get it in your mind. Either a conviction to stop doing something that was wrong or a conviction to do something that's the right thing to do. We're going to be talking about that today, and we'll come back to that story that you've got in your mind and help us think through our Bible passage in a little bit. We're in a series right now called Not Home Yet. Not Home Yet, because this world, this life that we're living now is not our true home. It's not the life that we were made for. We were made for a life close together with God. A life that is coming in the future in its fullness. And so this time right now can never bring us ultimate fulfillment. And we shouldn't expect it to or we will constantly be disappointed. In this series, we're looking at two men, Daniel and Peter. These guys lived a long time apart from each other, about 600 years between the two of them. But they lived in very similar times, times of great turmoil and strife. And times when they were waiting for their hope to be fulfilled. And in this series, we're learning from these two guys, Daniel and Peter, how we can live right now in this time of waiting that we're in. Waiting for changes in this life, but also waiting for what is coming. And so the things that we're trying to accomplish in this series of messages, let's put those up on the screen. Study, never give up, and the end. So we're studying deeply these two books of the Bible, Daniel and First and Second Peter, which kind of go together. We're learning how to study the Bible. That's something we want to come out with. We're doing those classes we talked about earlier and last week. 
Never give up. We're going to see how Daniel and Peter were men who, who modeled this for us. That when everything comes against you, it seems like there's no hope. All you have to do is keep doing what God's asked you to do. It might not look like it's going to succeed, but God always wins in the end because he's God. So you just keep going. Tyler talked about that to us a couple of weeks ago with uh, home is just around the corner. Just keep paddling, people. Just keep going after God. And then if, later on in this series of messages, Daniel has a lot to say about the end of the world. We're going to be talking about prophecy and the end of the world. Um, what's that going to be like? How can we know? Can we know when it's going to be? Are we close to it? We don't know. So that's this series of messages we're going through right now. Not home yet. All right, so let's remind ourselves of where we were last week. We just started this series, and Daniel, he was, he's 14 years old at this point. He's gone through horrific circumstances. His hometown of Jerusalem had been besieged by an enemy army. In fact, the most powerful army in the world, the Babylonian army, and King Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't that a fun name to say? Can you say it three times fast? Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not going to try so King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he's got a funny name. He was not a funny guy. I don't know if he ever cracked a joke in his whole life. He was a guy who liked to murder people, execute people all the time. He liked to do terrible, terrible things to his enemies, which was pretty much anybody that came across his path. And so Daniel, his town was besieged by this guy. The king was a king named Jehoiakim that Daniel knew, a relative of Daniel's. This king had gone away from God. He'd gone the wrong way. And because of that, God allowed this enemy army to come and take him out. So Jehoiakim died. Daniel saw firsthand two ways to live. He'd seen his, his relative Josiah earlier in his life who'd followed after God. And the results of that, the fruit, the good things that came out of his life. He saw Jehoiakim turn his back on God and he saw the fruit of that, death and destruction. And now this terrible thing has happened to Daniel and his friends. Uh, they've been taken captive into Babylon. They are slaves. And we saw last week, Daniel made this decision deep down. And this decision really gave us a picture of what, what is faith. Daniel had lots of evidence to show him that God is real. God is alive. He's, he's not taking this. Faith doesn't mean believing in something for no good reason. He has lots of reasons. But he doesn't see God winning the day right in front of him. What he sees right in front of him is the Babylonians conquering the world. But Daniel chooses to believe that God is sovereign. God is in control over the Babylonians. In fact, when bad things happen, all he's got to do is keep going after God. And eventually, it will become clear that God is in control. He looked at those two ways of life and his relatives and he said, I don't want to be like Jehoiakim. I don't want to turn my back on God and just go with whatever looks right in this world right now because that's the way of destruction. I see that. Whatever happens to me, he faces his own darkness and he decides to boldly believe in God no matter what happens. And so that's where we're at here. And now we're going to read a little bit more in a moment. What's happened here is some time has passed. Daniel and his friends were taken captive. They've been taken all the way to the city of Babylon itself. They've been taken into the royal court. And this is a, this crazy mixed blessing and curse for Daniel and his friends. They are taken to be trained to be part of the royal court. So they could become very high officials in the most powerful government in the world at their time. And yet, at the same time, they are slaves they have no freedom at all. It, they didn't get to choose whether they would do this or not. They can't go home. They can't go see their own relatives. Daniel and his friends have had to give up a lot of things in this moment. They've had to give up even seeing their own relatives. The Babylonians have changed the way that they look. They've made them dress differently. You've got to dress like Babylonians now. And you've got to talk like Babylonians now. Daniel and his friends have learned the language of Babylon, the language of Aramaic. And so as we read this next section, we can see actually that some time has passed. The story in Daniel doesn't tell us how much time, but it's enough time 
that you'll see in this section we're about to read, Daniel can speak and communicate with his, uh, his captors, his, the official who's in charge of him. He can communicate very fluently, which means he's had enough time to learn an entirely new language. So some time has passed. Let's go ahead and read it now, uh, the first section that we're going to look at today. And we'll see what happens with Daniel and his friends. So they're now in the court at Babylon. Daniel chapter 1, starting at verse 8. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. Next verse. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king. Notice the environment that they live in. Even this high official is terrified of the king. I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head. The king would execute him if Daniel and his friends didn't look as good as the rest of the young men. The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Next slide. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. And treat your servants in accordance with what you see. All right. So let's talk a little bit what's, about what's happening here with Daniel. So we see, like I said, Daniel has had some time that he's been in this new court, this court of the Babylonian king. We know that because he's learned the language. He's also made friends with the official who's in charge of him. He's gained favor with him. You can see the guy doesn't just say no. He doesn't treat Daniel like he's this, this lowly slave. He treats Daniel almost like he's a friend. He wants to help Daniel. So this tells us a number of things about Daniel as well. Um, so Daniel is in this precarious position. He's in this spot where he's, he could gain a position of high power from where he's at. He is in the top-notch school of the entire world. So he, he's like in the Harvard or Oxford of the world at that time. Yet he's a slave, and the environment, I was trying to think about what is this environment like that we could relate to, where everybody is terrified of the king. You might be executed or tortured or whatever at any moment, at the drop of a hat, at the king's whim. I thought, if you've seen these movies, it's a little bit like the environment of the Hunger Games, I think. Now, not all of you will have seen those, so I won't talk about it too long, but in the Hunger Games in the capital, it's that kind of an environment. These people are given this chance to uh, gain high power and esteem, but there's murder going on all over the place. And everybody, including those who look like they're in a great position, are terrified for their lives. So Daniel's in this spot, and imagine the temptation in that position. The temptation would be, I'm sure, like what happens in the Hunger Games, is all the new recruits, I'm sure what most of them did was start fighting with each other. Start, you know, having politics games, see who, who could become the best, see who could get into the king's favor the most, vying for position. That's what's going on in that environment. Everybody was everybody else's enemy. But the fact that Daniel has made a friend of this royal official, and Daniel, just the tone of his whole life, shows us that Daniel did something quite different in that environment. He said, forget about the politics. I've already made my decision. I'm not going the way of the world. I'm not going to try and get the best spot for myself. You know, God's put me here, so I'm just going to serve him the best way that I know how. In fact, he does something that Peter, 600 years later, is going to tell us to do as well. Let me show you in, in first, or, yeah, first Peter chapter 2. This is our key verse for the series and then the verse that follows it. And we're going to see Peter say something here that's very much what Daniel is doing in that court of Babylon. 
Our key verse for this whole series of messages is this. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Do you think Daniel felt like an alien and a stranger, a foreigner in the court of Babylon? To abstain from sinful desires. Sinful desires like vying for position, trying to beat everybody else. Because those war against your soul. Instead of that, live such good lives among the pagans that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. What Peter is saying here is just what we've already said. It's very simple what we need to do, even if the whole world seems against us, if we feel like strangers in the world or in a situation in our life, Don't worry about fighting with everybody else or vying for position. Don't worry about protecting your rights. Just serve God in that situation. Do the very best job that you can, not for the evil king Nebuchadnezzar, not to become the greatest, but just to serve God, who is your creator, who is your heavenly father, and who loves you more than you can imagine. And this is exactly what we see Daniel doing. He adopts this attitude of, I'm just going to do the best I can. They want me to learn Aramaic. Okay, let's do this thing. I'm going to learn Aramaic to the best of my ability. Even though I don't want to speak Aramaic, it's weird to me. Uh, They want me to dress like a Babylonian. Okay, I'm doing it. They want me to to not visit my family and friends. All right, fine. That sucks. But I'm not going to go see anybody who I knew. I'm just, these are going to be my new friends. I'm going to try and make friends with these people even though they're all scared of each other and fighting each other. And it starts to work. We see that he gains favor with this high official. That is remarkable. So even though he's in this terrible situation, things start to go pretty well for Daniel. But we've talked about over the last few weeks, in this world, we can expect trouble. In fact, that is promised to us. And so, even though things are starting to go well for Daniel, it shouldn't be a surprise, and I don't think it was to him, that something really bad, trouble comes. Trouble is brewing. So, this is the first point you can write down for today. Um, Here we go. If you decide to follow God, and I hope that you do, it's the best decision you can ever, ever make. But if you decide to follow God, expect resistance. This world, the forces of evil in this world, will resist you as you try to follow God. And that's what happens with Daniel. He runs into this roadblock. Notice he's gone along with all kinds of things. In fact, he's gone along with most of what they've asked him to do, which would have been very hard to do, to change the way you dress, you change the way where you live, you're changing everything about the way you speak. But They also ask him to eat things that he is not allowed to eat. There comes a moment where Daniel is under conviction. You see, in those days, unlike today, God had given his people particular things that they could not eat. It was written very clearly in the Bible. Don't eat these things. And when he got to Babylon, they said, here's your food. And they gave him a table, right? They allowed him to come to the king's table. This is some of the best food in the world. Maybe it was just the best food in the world. But most of it were things that Daniel was not allowed to eat. Meat from animals that were considered unclean. That The Bible said, don't eat these. If you are a follower of God at that time, don't eat these animals. And there they were on the table. And most of the food on the table had been sacrificed or prayed over to a pagan god. And we don't know, actually, it's an interesting thing to think about, did Daniel start out eating the food or not? It doesn't actually say. It doesn't say that he never ate from that table. Now, maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't. It doesn't say that he did. Maybe in the beginning he started out eating it and felt very convicted. Have you ever started doing something that you thought at first, that's not going to be wrong, it's going to be okay. And then once you did it, oh, you had that feeling right in your gut. That wasn't the right way to go. 
Or maybe it wasn't that way. Maybe he never ate from the table. Maybe he started off just hiding, you know, pretending to eat the food and kind of hiding from the officials, but he realized that he would not be able to hide forever. Now, I want us to get a little bit into this, into this food analogy and this food story and think about what would this have been like for Daniel. This is one of our principles in how do we study the Bible. You got to dive in. Don't just read the words on the page when you're reading your Bible at home. You got to use your imagination and stir up all of your different senses, your thoughts, your feelings, and try to put yourself in the place of the people that you're reading about. Then those stories, those things that happened to people a long time ago that they learned amazing lessons about God from, those stories are going to come alive for you. Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. Now, you got to keep paying attention till the end of the message and the end of church today. Do not go get any food from your kitchen while we're doing this. But we're going to look at some pictures of food. All right, so what are some of the best foods, the best things that we like to eat? Because this is going to help us get into this moment for Daniel. All right, Tim Hortons. All right, it's still morning. How many of you are drinking coffee right now? Yeah, I got a few hands in here. How many of you love that? Oh, Tim Hortons, you get the double-double. I think you're ridiculous if you drink anything but black coffee. That's the way to go, black coffee. But some people like this, some people, and the Timbits. Yeah, delicious. Oh, imagine. Use your imagination, if, unless you're actually drinking it. Think what that tastes like. Oh, oh, so good. Next one. Oh, pizza. Do I got any pizza lovers? When that cheese is melty and it's, oh, you, get, you haven't had pizza for a long time. Oh, delicious. Pepperoni. Yes, that's my favorite. Next one. Okay, or what about this barbecue ribs? Oh, man. Oh, think of the smell. Think of what it feels like in your mouth if you're a rib lover. Other, if you're a meat lover, okay, check out this next one here we got to. I think we got some more meat coming up. Oh, buffalo wings. Do I got any buffalo wing lovers? Oh, yeah, I can hear you at home. I can, I can see you clapping and cheering. Yeah, oh, it's delicious. Okay, next one, especially hot wings. Yeah, or nachos. Nachos just with everything. So melty, gooey, delicious. Okay, next one, next one. Oh, or the cheeseburger. I don't know why, but it keeps coming up on my playlist, that song, Cheeseburger in Paradise. You guys like that song? Jimmy Buffett, I love that song. It always makes me hungry for a cheeseburger. Oh, that looks amazing. Doesn't it? Classic, classic. Okay, next one. Or if you're sweet, if you have a sweet tooth, there's so many things we could have put up. This is one of my favorites, creme brulee. You ever go to a fancy restaurant and you break through that top layer and oh, it just is so smooth and delicious in your mouth. Okay, so stir up all those images, all those feelings. That's what Daniel feels and sees on this king's table. This is your food, man. This is what the king requires you to eat. And he feels, all of a sudden, he feels in his gut a conviction. And the conviction says, nope, you can't eat any of that. For how long? Like forever. For as long as you're here, which could be the rest of your life, what you've got to eat is this. Celery. I put celery up because it's my least favorite vegetable. Yep, you got it right. Stringy. And you're going to eat celery without even having peanut butter on it. Nope, no peanut butter. You're going to lose, there's, a, there's a, a, a tape measure on there. You're going to lose a lot of weight, Daniel. You're going to be a skinny guy. But yeah, instead of all those delicious things that you have right in front of you that you're being commanded to eat, by the king who might kill you, okay? You've got to eat, you have this conviction that you've got to eat just celery all the time. Now, just the physical part of that would be really, really hard, wouldn't it? And indefinitely, this is going to go on, we don't know how long, like forever. And to make, to make it even better, here's the thing. You've got to eat celery instead of all the best food in the world. And the king might kill you for doing it. You might be tortured and executed because you decide to eat celery. But you've got this conviction in you. And you've already made this decision that you are going to. You are going to follow after God's way, not the way of this world. Now, let me tell you, that's a moment when trouble has come in Daniel's life. That's a moment when trouble has come. 
I want to talk for a minute right here about the question, does God speak to human beings today? Does God speak to human beings at any point in history? Does He speak to human beings today? Sometimes I've met people, I've even felt like this sometimes in my life, like, why isn't God speaking? Why doesn't He, you know, just speak to me in a really clear way that's obvious? You know, why doesn't He, he you know, just talk out of the sky to me, like with a big booming voice, so I know that it's Him? Why doesn't He send an angel to me? Or, or why doesn't he at, at least, you know, line up circumstances in my life so it's really, really obvious there can be no question that it's God speaking to me in that moment. It seems like God doesn't speak. Sometimes I've heard that complaint and felt that way in my life. Now, it's interesting, when we get further in this book, Daniel is going to hear God speak. He's going to have God speak to him in some of the clearest, most specific most direct ways of anyone in the whole Bible. He's going to have angels literally show up in front of him and tell him, Daniel, here's what's going to happen for the next 400 years, play by play. That doesn't happen to very many people. It's going to happen to Daniel. In fact, even next week, we're going to be looking at a time when God communicated really clearly in a remarkable, miraculous way with Daniel. But notice... Notice that before any of that happens in Daniel's life, God is already speaking to him in the normal ways. And Daniel is listening. That's critical. God doesn't often speak, or he doesn't speak very much, if we don't listen, if we continue to not pay attention to him. What are the ways that God is speaking to Daniel in this story? God is speaking to Daniel through the Bible. He's speaking to Daniel through the Bible. That is one of the normal ways that God communicates. God is also speaking to Daniel through his conscience, through the way that he feels. Let's think about these two things for a minute. Is it a cop-out to say, God, does God speak to you? Yes, he speaks to you through the Bible. Is that a cop-out? God speaks to everybody through the Bible. It's not a cop-out. God is actually communicating to you in particular, or He's trying to, through His written Word. Because I'm not just talking about the fact that the Bible says a lot of things that apply to you. I'm talking about this reality. If you read the Bible regularly, you pray and ask God to communicate to you through it, He will tell you specific things that you need to do through His written Word. There will be parts of the Bible that jump out to you and take hold of you, like they did for me. I was talking about that earlier, how there was a moment in my life, in early on in, in my following of Christ, where I felt convicted that I needed to share the Word of God. I needed to share the message of Jesus with people. How did that conviction come to me? I read it in the Bible. I read a lot of things in the Bible. Some stood out, some stand out to me at different moments, different times. At that time, that one in particular grabbed hold of me. Why? Because God was communicating to me through His Word. That's what's happening to Daniel here. There's lots of things, like I said, that Daniel and his friends have gone along with in the court of Babylon. Okay, we'll do that, we'll do that, we'll do that. And when it comes to this one, they know there's a command not to eat this food. And it grabs hold of Daniel. It is God speaking to Daniel through his word. But let's think about the second way, conscience. This idea that God doesn't speak to human beings, it's actually quite laughable. Let me read for you a definition. This is just, I like to do just the first Google definition. I don't have this on the screen, but this is a definition of what the word conscience means. All right, you ready? This is what Google says. Conscience, our conscience, is an inner feeling or voice that is viewed as acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. Think about this for a minute. You have all, everyone listening to this, has experienced maybe many times a day the feeling of your conscience telling you to do something or not to do something. How bizarre is that? If that wasn't something that's been, that had been happening to us our entire lives, we would be shocked when it happens. Think about that moment. You want to do 
this thing over here. Everything in your mind, your heart, your thoughts wants to go this way and do something. And all of a sudden, something that seems like a voice or an inner feeling shows up inside of you and tells you, nope, don't go that way, go this other way. A voice shows up in your head and tells you what to do and tells you things that are wrong and you shouldn't be going that way. And that's a regular experience for human beings all over the world throughout all of history. And then we say, why doesn't God speak to me? God is speaking to human beings all the time. Probably like a hundred times a day he's talking to you. The question is, are you listening? The question is, are you listening? So, point number two for you to write down, I would encourage you to write it down, is when God speaks, when God speaks, believe it. If every time God speaks, you say, nope, that's not God speaking, that's something else. Oh, the Bible says I should do this, that's not God speaking, that's just the Bible. Oh, my conscience says I shouldn't do that, oh, that's not God speaking, that's just my conscience. If you do that with every time that God speaks, you will never hear God. Because you don't believe that he's speaking, even when he's speaking to you all the time. You could do the same thing with an angel, by the way. If an angel showed up in front of you and told you a whole bunch of things that God wanted you to know, you could say, that's not really an angel. That's just something I ate for lunch that made me have weird thoughts and feelings. That's just a hallucination. You could discount anything. When God speaks to you, believe that he's speaking to you. Because he is. All right. The final thing we want to draw out of Daniel here, we've got this moment where Daniel, he has to make a decision. He's experiencing conviction for something maybe that he's already doing wrong or at least something that he knows he should not do. He should not eat that food that's on the king's table. He knows that God's way is, nope, that's not it. Now, anytime there's a moment of conviction, this is another moment of decision. It's another moment of choice. I want you to bring to your mind now, bring to your mind as vividly as you can a moment when you experienced conviction. Either not to do something or to do something you should do. If, you, if you know, things like when I stole that toy, that, that moment when, what was I going to do with that? Uh, things like I needed to go tell someone about Jesus. What was I going to do with that? Was I going to get out of that car, which was really scary to me, and speak to those strangers? Or was I going to go and hide in my house? Now, right at that moment when you experience conviction, we've already said God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you through your conscience, by His Spirit. He's speaking to you through His Word. He's telling you what you need to do. You have a choice. Are you going to do it or not? And those choices have long-term consequences. Some of us, some people in this life, get to the point where they don't experience their conscience very much anymore because they've pushed through it too many times. If you have, you know, I'm going to steal a toy, and if I experience this feeling of guilt, I shouldn't do it. But I say, no, 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 just get rid of that. I am a person who steals, and I do it anyway. And I repeat, rinse and repeat that cycle. Eventually, my conscience will be something I just get used to and don't even experience anymore. I will shut out the voice of God in my life. Same thing with the Bible. Same thing with not doing the things God has asked me to do. There's a thing that I know God is asking me to do. I feel convicted I should do it, but I no, I hate that. I'm going to push it away. I'm going to go hide in my room. If you keep on doing that, what you will experience over time is you'll feel like God is not talking to you. More and more, it will seem like the heavens are silent. The opposite is also true. If you do it, If you step out in faith, even if it's scary, even if you mess it up royally, if you do it, then you will experience more and more the voice and presence of God in your life. It's what we see in Daniel. It's what we see all throughout the Scripture. So your last point for today is this. When God speaks, do what He says is right here below the screen. When God speaks, do what He says. The Bible is not rocket science, though it does explain far more than rocket science. The Bible is very simple and straightforward 
in what we need to do. It's are we going to do it? That's the constant question. It's a question of your heart. We'll wrap up by reading a little bit more and looking at the results of Daniel's obedience. He does not push past. He doesn't force down his conscience or his feelings that come from the Word of God. He doesn't do that. He acts on it. He takes a huge risk. And here's what happened next. Daniel 1, 13 to 15. He says this, then you can compare our appearance. So test us for 10 days. Give us this test and let us eat just the celery. And then compare our appearance with that of the other young men who eat the royal food. And then treat your servants in accordance. Oh, can we go back? Treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So the royal official agreed to this. God shows up in grace and mercy and helps Daniel because he takes this step of faith. The royal official agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Now, some of you who are vegetarians are probably like, yeah, that's what happens. No, no, this is a miracle. You ate nothing but celery and you looked amazing at the end of 10 days. That's a miracle. Next slide. So the guard took away their choice food, took away the Tim Hortons and the barbecued ribs and the pizza and the wine that they were to drink, and he gave them only celery, only vegetables instead. Then the world took away that amazing food that they'd been given. All they have is celery. Such a sad day. But God, God, To these four young men, God gave. God gave knowledge. God gave understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. The thing that they were trying to do, do such a good job at the Harvard University of their day, God gave them incredible power to do it. They beat out everybody else without even trying. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. When you obey God and take that step of faith, when you feel that conviction and you say, I'm I'm not going to ignore it or suppress it or push it away. I'm going to jump out in faith even though I'm scared. I'm going to stop doing the thing I shouldn't do or I'm going to start doing the thing that I should. God will honor that in your life. And that is better than all the best food and even better than a Tim Hortons double-double. It is the best thing that can happen to you in this world is to have God's grace active and powerful in your life. Next week, we're going to see that God leads them to even greater heights. God is now going to be able to use Daniel and his friends to change the world. And he can use you too. Let's pray today and we'll continue in worship. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much.